Hello, I'm JJ Joaquin, and welcome to Philosophy and What Matters, where we discuss things that matter from a philosophical point of view. Now, today, we'll talk about Gottlob Frege. Now, Gottlob Frege is recognized as one of the founders of analytic philosophy. Now, his contributions range from logic to the philosophy of mathematics and the philosophy of language. Now, guiding us through the philosophy of Frege is my dear friend, uh, Patricia Blanchett, McMahon Hank Professor of Philosophy at the University of Notre Dame, and the author of the book, Frege's Conception of Logic. So hello, Professor Blanchett. Welcome to Philosophy and What Matters. Hello, JJ. <laughs> okay, so before we get into our main topic, let's first discuss your philosophical background. How did you get into philosophy? You know, I, I had the good fortune to go to one of those universities that allows you, indeed requires you, to take courses in lots of different fields. Mm -hmm. And so um, I stumbled into philosophy. I, I actually took a logic course because I thought it sounded interesting, and, and it was. And it was interesting enough that I took the next few things taught by that professor, and suddenly after some time, I had more philosophy courses than I had of the things I had intended to study. Mm -hmm. So I just kept doing it. And um, yeah, I, I, like so many people, I, I fell into it and, and I loved it. And, and that was the end of the story, really. So who was this professor? Uh, yeah, so my first uh, philosophy professor was um, a junior professor by the name of Paolo Dow. Mm -hmm. um, he didn't. He didn't stay in philosophy, um, but he was my introduction to the field. Okay, so you did a lot of logic during that time. So, what sort of logic were you introduced to? Um, my first logic course was actually an introduction to set theory, mm -hmm. and I thought that was very interesting. And so then I took um, just a couple of courses in modern first-order logic um, up through completeness and. Um, Levenham Skolem theorems as an undergraduate. That was that was all I did really in logic. Uh, there wasn't very much to do. Um, I did a little bit of computability, um, mm. but, but not much. <laughs> so, who influenced you to pursue a career in academic philosophy? You know, I think probably every philosophy professor I had as an undergraduate was really important to me. Um, I, I thought that. Uh, the idea of, of thinking hard about texts and about philosophical ideas looked fascinating and exciting. And then um, it looked fascinating enough to get into graduate school. And, and then I had some, some, some very formative mentors there, John Echemendi, John Perry, John Barwise. Mm -hmm. These were all people whose work meant a lot to me and whose, whose mentorship meant a lot to me. And uh, yeah, I think they sort of solidified my thought that philosophy was a really, really interesting way of life. <laughs> okay, so let's get into our main topic. So how did you get into the philosophy of Frege? Why specialize in Frege? That's a, that, a nice question. Um, I never intended just to work on Frege so much, but I was interested in the relationship between logic and language. Mm -hmm. And in particular, I was interested in logicism. So I was interested in this, this theory that, that mathematics is in some sense reducible to logic. And so I thought, well, so I should, I should read some logicism. So I, so I read um, Frege, and then I became really interested um, in sort of pursuing this idea to try to see where logicism went. So there was a point at which I thought I would write a dissertation on uh, logicism in general and do a little bit of Frege, a little bit of Carnap, a little bit of Russell and Whitehead. But the Frege sort of took over and it became all Frege. Um, also, a, a secondary interest was that I was interested in the philosophy of language. And I thought if I wanted to know about Frege's views about language, I should really understand his views about mathematics because they didn't seem to be uh, distinguishable in my view. So yeah, that's why Frege. <laughs> so you're before we get into his mathematics, his views about uh, logicism and his views about language, let's start with logic first. So what were his contributions to the development of logic? 
So Frege was one of the three people who gave us modern logic in the sense of a quantified system of logic. The other two people were Giuseppe Peano and C.S. Peirce. Uh, Frege's system was the, in some ways, the most well-developed, um, the most thoroughly developed system of logic. So, so what we get with Frege is what you now think of as first order and second order logic. That is a logic that involves the first order and the second order quantifiers and their interaction with the ordinary connectives of negation and conjunction and material conditional. Oh. Frege is one of the first people who, who puts together a system that is to say a formal language that has rules of formation for its sentences and rules of inference and axioms to give logical proofs to prove one sentence on the basis of other sentences. Prior to Frege's work, um, proofs were, were not nearly as, well, there was no way to formalize a proof. That is to turn rules of proof into rules that were syntactically given. And the interest of that is, is well, it's really interesting. Um, the, the interest of having formal systems of logic has changed over time. For Frege, the reason to have a formal system that is a syntactically defined bunch of rules was that this made it possible to systematically check whether the proofs were good proofs. So instead of relying on intuitive ideas of what follows from what, you have a very, very rigorous system within which you, you give proofs that follow very, very clear rules. And then it's clear that you can check them. But once Frege gave us this idea of, of syntactically specifying rules of inference and axioms for a system of logic, once we have that idea, then this turns out to be a very fruitful thing for, for a couple of reasons. It turns out to be very fruitful for what became meta-mathematics and turned into the work that Hilbert and Gödel gave us. And it also became extremely fruitful for what became computer science, because what you have with com computer languages, computer science in general, um, is a system by means of which everything can be specified syntactically, all of your rules of transformation. And so what you get with Frege is the beginning of modern logic and the beginning of what eventually becomes computability theory and computer science. Okay, so that's a, a, a long history from Aristotle. So someone has said that logic really started in 1879 with the publication of this book, The Griff Schrift. So why is this a monumental work in logic and in philosophy in general? So I should say one, one probably should not say that that's where logic starts. Logic, uh, certainly Aristotle was doing logic in some sense. Um, but modern logic arguably starts here. And I mean, one shouldn't forget Peirce and Peano as well, who were also extremely influential and doing very, very similar things. But what happens in the Begriffschrift is you get, yeah, the two things that I mentioned, namely um, a systematic use of quantifiers, which we just didn't have before. So this is, this is brand new and it's huge. And the, um, the syntactic specification of, of the rules of inference and the axioms of the system. The thing about the quantifiers is that prior to having a formal system of quantified logic, you can't give a nice treatment of inferences like this one. Um, um, every even number is greater than at least one odd number. Uh -huh. Six is an even number. Therefore, there is at least one odd number such that six is greater than it. That's a, a fairly rudimentary piece of reasoning that you've got to be able to make sense of in order to do anything sophisticated, in order to do mathematics, in order to reason about anything, really. Um, and unless you have a really nice way of using quantifiers, you can't actually talk about what makes that inference valid and what makes other inferences that are superficially like it invalid. So anyway, with the McGriff shift, you get the first nice systematic uh, treatment of quantifiers. <laughs> so this is a real development from like Aristotle and even Kant perhaps. So, so prior to 1879, um, you had some systematic treatments of various forms of inference. So uh, various syllogisms that Aristotle dealt with and various more sophisticated forms of inference dealt with by various medieval scholars. But, but what you didn't have was enough sophistication in the 
systematic inferences dealt with in logic to do mathematics. Mm -hmm. So the, the kinds of reasoning that mathematicians use every day to think about numbers um, were just too rich to be dealt with by the kinds of um, inferences that were nicely systematized by Aristotle and by later medievals. So there was just a big gap between what counted as good reasoning in a mathematical context and what counted as the kind of reasoning that we had any systematic treatment of prior to 1879. So is it safe to say that Frege's system is really developed because he wants to give a foundation to mathematical reasoning in yes. making? So that's yes. the main target. Yep, that is the main target. So, so Begriffschrift, the first system that Frege introduces, opens with the following question. Um, how much of mathematics is founded on pure logic? And for him, that's kind of the driving question. And it's a question that he doesn't think that he answers in 1879, but, but he thinks that in order to begin to answer the question, we need to get much more clear about what we mean by pure logic. And we need to have a system of proof that's really, really rigorous. And the reason for that is that in, in order to answer the question, how much of mathematics is grounded in logic, you need to be able to start with some mathematical truths and then show how to prove them from purely logical truths. So you need an account of what, well, not an account, you need a list of some purely logical truths and a list of some purely logical rules of proof and see if you can prove the fundamental truths of mathematics from those. So that's what he's beginning to do in the McGriff shift. Oh. But why was he considered as one of the founders of analytic philosophy? Ah, well, um, so I think really because of maybe three things. Um, the first is what we've already discussed. He gave us a system of logic. Oh. And so logic has turned out to be a really core part of analytic philosophy. It's, it's useful for, um, yeah, lots of reasons, right? So a, a core part of analytic philosophy is a view about um, what it is for certain things to follow from other things, of what it is for a truth to be analytic, of which parts of mathematics are grounded in logic, and all of those turn on views about logic. So, so having a system of logic is already critical to, um, to modern analytic philosophy. Um, another aspect of Frege's work that we haven't discussed yet that's essential to analytic philosophy is Frege's philosophy of language. Uh -huh. So Frege, um, as, as anyone who's, who's done a first course in the philosophy of language knows, Frege is one of the founders of a particular way of thinking of language and its relationship to our thought. So, so Frege thinks we can ask questions and give systematic answers to those questions regarding the meanings of the sentences that we use. And I can say more about that de in detail later, but, but the second way in which Frege is kind of a founder of analytic philosophy is that he's a founder of contemporary philosophy of language. Everyone who works in philosophy of language now has to either agree with Frege or disagree with Frege about certain fundamental views about language. And then um, thirdly, Frege has a view about um, about conceptual analysis that is really important to how we do analytic philosophy today. He thinks that um, you can, by careful analysis of, of concepts as these occur in, um, in ordinary science, in ordinary discourse, and in mathematics in particular, by careful analysis of our concepts, we can learn what kinds of principles ground the kind of discourse in question. So um, actually, let me mention a fourth thing. One thing that's really, really important uh, is a certain anti-psychologism that Frege has. Um, that is to say, a lot of Frege's views about language and about mathematics um, involve the following view, that the truths of mathematics and the truths about um, well, let's just say the truths of mathematics don't in fact have much to do with the way people actually reason. 
his anti-psychologism is the following view that psychology and mathematics are radically separate. Um, and this theme runs through a lot of his views about, about knowledge, about mathematics, about foundations of science. And so that's another theme that's been very, very important to contemporary analytic philosophy. Okay, so we touched on his views on the philosophy of mathematics, specifically his notion that mathematics is reducible to logic, or at least the, found, the foundations of mathematics would be a kind of logical foundation. So this is the logicist view. So you mentioned about the psychologist view, the or psycholo psychologism, which Frege and Russell, other guy who's the founder of logicism, were against. But what is their view all about, this logicism view, and what were its competitors? OK. Um, so I should say, first of all, let me just clarify one point. Frege doesn't think that all of mathematics is reducible to logic. He excludes geometry from this. So okay. Frege thinks that, that Kant is right about geometry, that geometry um, has some fundamental truths that are, um, that are known to us via pure intuition. And so, so geometry is, is, is not part of the logistics project for Frege. So you ask, what are the competitors? Um, Frege, Frege took himself to be arguing against, I think, really three different views. Um, one view was Kant's view. Uh, so, so Kant's view about arithmetic is similar to his view about, about geometry. That is to say that the fundamental truths of arithmetic are much richer than something that could be founded in pure logic, that one needs, in addition to logical reasoning, one needs pure intuition. So intuition of space for the case of geometry and presumably for time, of time for the case of, of arithmetic. So, so Frege wants to reject that view. He thinks that pure intuition plays no role in the foundations of arithmetic. By arithmetic here, by the way, he means um, not just what we might call arithmetic, which is sometimes taken to be just number theory, but mm. also real analysis as well. So the complete theory of, of real numbers as well. So anyway, um, one of the views then that Frege took himself to reject was Kant's view. Mm. Another view that he took himself to reject is a pure empiricist view of the kind um, that John Stuart Mill um, arguably held. Mill doesn't, I mean, I guess Mill clearly held an empiricist view. What exactly the view was, I think is hard to determine. But Mill thought that people come to know the fundamental truths of arithmetic via sensation. So for example, you uh, put three pebbles in a pile and five pebbles in a pile, and then you count them together and you have eight pebbles. And that's the beginning of your understanding that three plus five equals eight. And Frege, took that view to be clearly false. He thought it, it wouldn't work for large numbers. It certainly wouldn't work for infinite numbers. And he thought it was a very bad way to think about our knowledge of arithmetic. And then the third view is, I think, sort of a, a mush of different views that's hard to attribute to any one person, but the, the mush is just called psychologism. Um, that is to say, any view that says that part of the content of arithmetic is a bunch of claims about how people think. Oh. That, we'll call that psychologism. And Frege thinks that's false. No truth of arithmetic depends in any way, Frege thinks, on the ways that human beings actually reason or actually um, prove things to themselves. So um, he, thinks, he thinks that any view that says that part of the content of our claims about infinity have to do with the ways that people think about infinite collections has to be false. And fundamentally, his, his idea is that the truths of arithmetic would have been true no matter what kinds of brains people had, no matter whether there were any people, anything like that. They are as independent of us as claims about rocks and trees are independent of us. So, so those, I think, are the main views he took himself to reject. Okay, so you have intuitionism, the Kantian version where the truths of mathematics are products of the categories of the understanding, perhaps, of time. Yeah. Yeah. And you have empiricism that you need to look at the world, so to speak, and look at whether two rabbits and another two sets of rabbits would give you four rabbits. Well, that's not the case. Right. Yeah, no. <laughs> okay, and finally, you have psychologism that 
the truths of mathematics would depend on how people actually think about them. Yeah. So what is his theory? What is this logicism? It's, it looks like that uh, logicism implies a kind of realism about the truths of mathematics. So the truths of mathematics are, are out there, so to speak. But how do we know those things? We know those things via our capacity to reason logically. Mm -hmm. That is to say, via our capacity simply to, um, to reason in a way that avoids contradiction and to reason from premises to, um, to the things that follow from those premises. So the, the first thing to think about with respect to logic, I think, to understand what logic is for someone like Frege is to think about the fact that all of our reasoning involves following out the consequences of things that we believe. So, so if you believe that every politician is corrupt and you believe that Smith is a politician, well, you really ought to believe that Smith is corrupt. If you fail to draw the conclusion that Smith is corrupt, you have failed in some way. And indeed, if you, if you affirm in addition that Smith is not corrupt, then you've engaged in contradiction. So the, the fundamental human capacity to, to reason in accordance with logical entailment, that is to say, to, um, to draw a conclusion from premises when that conclusion really in fact follows from those premises, that's a, a human capacity uh, that obviously we all have, thinks someone like Frege, um, well, I, I presume thinks everybody, but anyway, it's a capacity that we all have because we can all reason and we can, we can critique each other's reasonings. So it's not just that we happen to say one thing after saying another, it's that sometimes we do so in a way that's justified because the thing we've inferred follows. And sometimes we do so in a way that's not justified because the thing we've inferred doesn't follow. So, so that relationship, the relationship of following from, oh. is something that Frege thinks we know something about. So how is it that we know something about that? We are just able to see consequences when they are simple enough. <laughs> so once you grant that, then it also looks like you have to grant that, that people are able to use that capacity, the capacity to reason logically. They're also able to use that capacity to know that some things are true. Not just that if something is true, then something else is true, but also to know that some things are true, like some conditional claims. We can make that inference that I just gave you into an if-then claim. We can say, if all politicians are corrupt and Smith is a politician, then Smith is corrupt. And there you go, there's a truth of logic. Uh -huh. So knowing the truths of, I mean, Frege isn't um, particularly interested in, in the psychological question of how people do stuff. But he does think that, that um, it's clear that, that there is a logical source of knowledge. And that is to say, it's that capacity that we have to reason in accordance with logical principles, to draw inferences and to recognize contradictions, things like that. And he thinks that's, that's something um, that gives rise to knowledge of truths. And it's clearly something that it has to be independent of our um, capacity to know things via sensation and independent of our capacity to know things by intuition. So it's different from those capacities. So that's the beginning. And Frege thinks that if he can show you that the fundamental truths of arithmetic are provable using just the kinds of truths that you can come to know via your logical capacity, then he'll be done. He will have shown you that you don't need anything like um, pure intuition, and you don't need anything like sensation in order to come to know the truths of arithmetic. That's the story. Mm -hmm. and, okay. and then the, the details are where it gets hard. Yeah, that's the next question. Was he successful in reducing mathematics, arithmetic to logic? Sadly, no. <laughs> um, it, it looked like he would be successful. So this, this book that you have in front of us, the Grundlage, the, um, the Foundations of Arithmetic, was a really fabulous work. And in it, Frege introduces his audience to the kind of conceptual analysis of arithmetic that he thinks will be important to following out his logicist project. And he also begins to introduce his audience to the kinds of proofs that he will give. 
So his idea is that he will show that logicism is true by doing two things. First thing, give a really thorough analysis of what arithmetical statements mean, so we can see clearly what we're dealing with. Secondly, show that once the statements are understood in this way, we can prove them from purely logical premises. So the Foundations of Arithmetic um, book written in 1884 is an attempt to do the first part of that and to sketch the second part of that. So he does that and it looks very promising. It looks very good. He gives us a very rich, it turns out very influential way of analyzing um, arithmetical truths. And he begins to give the proofs and it looks like that will work out too. But then in 1893, he starts to do the really, really hard work of giving the proofs in excruciating detail. He has a, a nice new formal system, which is richer than the system of the Begriffschrift that we spoke about earlier. And he translates his analysis of arithmetical truths into the language of this new system, system of Grundgesetze, and he tries to give, indeed he gives, unbelievably rigorous step by step by step by step by step proofs so that after many, many, many pages, you get things like one is the successor of zero. It takes a long time to go to work. So that's the um, piano action. That's the first one. Right. <laughs> well, it's, the yeah, so the he, second he, word, yeah. he gives us, um, yeah, he gives us a version of, of the piano axioms uh, and it looks like he can prove them from purely logical principles. It looks, it looks beautiful, mm. but then it turns out uh, it doesn't work so well. So in 1902, Frege gets a letter from Bertrand Russell explaining to him that you can prove a contradiction in Frege's formal system. And this is, this is really bad. This is as bad as anything can be for a formal system. So let me remind you, the formal system was a, a bunch of fundamental logical truths and fundamental logical rules of inference for getting new truths from old truths. Uh -huh. So using the axioms, the fundamental truths, and the rules, using those, you ought to be able to prove only truths of logic. Everything you prove should be a truth of logic. And that's why proving the truths of arithmetic in this way would show that the truths of arithmetic are truths of logic. But alas, as Russell showed, you can prove a contradiction. So that means that you can prove something false. Mm -hmm. And so that means something has gone badly, badly, badly wrong. Either one of the axioms or one of the rules has to be mistaken. And it was very clear which axiom it was. There's only one candidate and it was, um, it was called basic law five. It's a particular um, <laughs> thing that Frege thought was a truth of logic and it isn't. We now know it's not a truth of logic. So, so Frege's entire system required this thing, basic law five, to be a principle of logic and it isn't. Mm -hmm. So the whole thing falls apart. And what's really painful is that both parts of what I've just described as the two part project fall apart. Part one was the analysis of arithmetical truths and part two was the proofs of the thus analyzed truths. And because basic law five, the thing that leads to the contradiction um, is the really critical thing. It's the critical principle that governs things called value ranges, which are a lot like sets. Um, it's the critical principle governing those because that's the principle that's false. Well, Frege's analysis of arithmetical claims turns out to be very, very problematic because he analyzed arithmetical claims in such a way that they all have to do with value ranges, these oh. things that are accessed. So, so the analysis turns on value ranges and value ranges don't behave the way Frege said they did. Mm -hmm. So his analysis is bad. The proofs turn on value ranges and value ranges don't behave Frege, the way Frege thought they did. So the proofs are bad. So the whole thing falls apart. So um, yeah, so Frege did not prove that logicism is true. And, and it turns out for other reasons, um, there isn't a good way to, to fix Frege's system. It, it may be that logicism is true, um, but it certainly cannot be proven to be true in anything like Frege's way. So is this like the fruit of the poison tree? 
principle going on? <laughs> um, well, um, yeah, I don't know. Uh, so, so it, it was very bad. Um, certainly, yeah, it was it was terrible for Frege that his whole thing crashed and burned. On the other hand, um, out of this crashing and burning, we've had a massive flowering of things. So, so what we learned was that it wasn't just Frege's particular idiosyncratic way of thinking of value ranges that was problematic. It was the way that everybody had thought about collections, set-like things, or ranges of values of functions. So um, for much of the 19th century, um, people had been reasoning carefully about collections of numbers, about collections of functions, about collections of functions of functions, etc., in ways that that in the background used something like Frege's Basic Law Five, some principle like what we call now the principle of extensionality for collections of things and for yeah, as I say, ranges of values of functions. So. What we saw with, with Russell's paradox and with, um, with some paradoxes that came up just a couple of years before that, though Frege didn't know it, mm -hmm. um, uh, that were discovered by Zermelo in about 1900, what we see here is that a way of reasoning that was really important to mathematics at the time turns out to have been um, unreliable. And so, so it became clear right around 1900, 1901, 1902, that something different had to be done, that if we were going to um, keep reasoning, both in the way that Frege had been reasoning and in the way that everybody who'd been talking about sets, um, especially Cantor had been reasoning, turned out we needed to fix the system. We needed um, to figure out how to safely reason about collections of things and courses of values of functions. And that's where axiomatic set theory comes in. Mm -hmm. so, so axiomatic set theory is a way of laying down principles which will give us a good, fruitful, safe theory of collections, which allows us to do the mathematics that we want to do and avoids the paradoxes that befell Frege's system. Unfortunately, axiomatic set theory is, it doesn't meet the conditions for being pure logic that mm -hmm. Frege thought. And so even though now we know how to do a lot of what Frege wanted to do by using an axiomatic system of set theory, um, there are a couple of reasons to think that this isn't a vindication of Frege's logistics project. One reason, the main reason, is that it, it looks like the principles of axiomatic set theory do it's not count. As, they're just not purely logical. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so... Um, yeah. Yeah, so let's not get into the Russell paradox because okay. yeah, Russell's paradox has been discussed in many other books and podcasts. Sure, yeah. so let's, let's just ask the question, is the logicist program still alive and well in contemporary philosophy of mathematics? There, um, there is interest in logicism in contemporary philosophy of mathematics. Um, the most active project is what's called the Neo-Logicist Project, which follows on from some work by Crispin Wright um, and Bob Hale. So there's a, a book by Crispin Wright called Frege's Conception of Numbers as Objects, in which Wright suggests that we can resurrect a logicist program that is in some ways like Frege's. So, so let me just say something about why it's not the same as Frege's and, and why it's interesting nevertheless. So Frege's strategy was, of course, to start with purely logical truths and to prove all of the truths of arithmetic. Um, the neologicist strategy is to start with something different. Um, it's to start with some logical truths and then a thing called Hume's principle, which is a principle that just essentially says this, uh, the number of, well, if we have some two properties, like the property of coffee cups on my desk and the property of pens on my desk. We can say the number of coffee cups on my desk is identical with the number of pens on my desk. So there's a statement oh. of identity. And we want to know under what conditions is that true? And here is Hume's principle, an instance of it. The number of coffee cups on my desk is identical with the number of pens on my desk, if and only if there is a one-to-one -one matching up 
of the coffee cups on my desk with the pens on my desk. So that seems good. And in general, the idea is the number of, we'll call our two properties F and G, the number of Fs is identical with the number of Gs, if and only if there's a one-to-one -one matching of the F things onto the G things. This works for finite and for infinite um, collections of things. So that's very nice. This principle called Hume's principle uh, played a large role in Frege's own project. He thought that he could prove this principle from purely logical principles. You can't. Um, and so the neologicist strategy is merely to start with that principle as one of the foundations of the project. Start with that principle plus logic and then prove the Peano axioms. Okay. So this differs from Frege's project in one fundamental way, which is that um, Hume's principle doesn't look like a truth of logic. Mm -hmm. And indeed, I think it's clear for various reasons that it would not have been thought of by Frege as a truth of logic, unless you could prove it to be one in the way that he tried to. Well, once Frege sees that um, his axiom, basic law five, is not a truth of logic, it would follow from that, I think, that Hume's principle in his view is not a truth of logic because Hume's principle is very, very, very like basic law five. In any case, so there is debate about this these days, whether or not one should think of Hume's principle as something like a truth of logic. So first clear difference between the neologicist project and Frege's project is that Frege's project wanted to start with fundamental truths of logic the neologicist project doesn't care so much about whether the fundamental principles are principles of logic. They're interested in starting with Hume's principle because it's special in some way. It's something like analytic. Mm -hmm. So that's good. Another big problem though, is that when Frege was writing, it seemed that it would be possible to prove the Peano axioms from truths of logic and thereby guarantee that every truth of arithmetic was a truth of logic because it seemed that one could prove every truth of arithmetic from the Peano axioms. So sort of three steps, start with logic, prove the Peano axioms, and then use those to prove any truth of arithmetic you want. Mm -hmm. But we know um, because of Gödel's incompleteness theorem, the first one, that this won't work. It's not true that from the Peano axioms, you can prove every truth of arithmetic. Indeed, it's not true that from any manageable collection of axioms, you can prove every truth of arithmetic. So, so another thing that distinguishes the neologicist project from the Fragian project is that it is not an attempt to prove a core collection of mathematical truths from which one can in turn prove all of the truths of arithmetic. There is no such core collection of truths. The neologicist project is instead to prove a core collection of arithmetical truths that suffices in a very different way for all of the truths of arithmetic. And for those who've done some logic, it suffices in the sense that every model of those axioms, of the second order piano axioms, is a model of every truth of arithmetic. And I think that there isn't any way that Frege would think of that relationship between the piano axioms and the rest of arithmetic as supporting the logicist claim. So that's another very important difference between them. For Frege, the important connection between the Peano axioms and the truths of arithmetic was going to have been proof theoretic. You can prove the one from the other. Whereas for the neologicist project, it's a, it's a very different relationship. It's a model theoretic relationship. It's a model theoretic relationship. Yep. Yeah. Yep. So, but there's another movement going on around known as paraconsistent mathematics. I think what they're trying to do is, okay, let's abandon all hope about consistency. <laughs> And let's just accept that there are contradictions within your system and have a logic that guarantees that, well, your contradictions won't lead to any other proposition. What do you think of that kind of project? I, I think it's really interesting and I think it's both technically and conceptually fruitful. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think, um, I don't think it's easy to think of it as giving us what Frege wanted, which is an account of those principles such that our knowledge of them is both sufficient for mathematics and counts as obviously correct principles of reasoning. Because you have to be 
very careful when you're doing paraconsistent logic to make sure that uh, the inconsistencies that arise in some parts of your system don't ever touch the parts of the system that you really care about. And the kind of care that you need for that is, again, a really, really interesting project, but it, it's not a project that turns on the claim that, um, that the principles you use in being so careful are self-evident logical truths. Mm. So, yeah. So also, I don't like contradictions myself. <laughs> actually, um, so, so I think it is, I think it's conceptually really interesting, but, but for my own part, um, and this is one of the reasons that I, that I don't know very much, to be honest, about the paraconsistent approaches, though I wish I did. Um, it's that I have kind of a Fragian picture of um, the connection between truth and contradiction and uh, the connection between truth and negation. And on that picture, it isn't possible for there to be a contradiction that's true. Indeed, on that picture, the claim that, that some sentence is true conflicts with the claim that that sentence is a contradiction. And so, so it's really hard from this point of view to, to understand what it would be for, for a contradiction to in fact be true. It's hard to get a grip from a Freudian point of view, indeed from my point of view too, um, hard to get a grip on what a contradiction is actually saying. Uh, so in any case, yeah, that's, that's one reason that the paraconsistent approach I think is um, pretty radically different from anything that Frege would think of as a, as a logical approach. Okay, so most students uh, are introduced to Frege's philosophy through his works on the philosophy of language. So could you give us an overview of his main ideas here and how these ideas connect with his overall philosophy? Yeah, yeah, good, nice question. Um, so you have, you have the classic essay up here on sense and reference, as it's called, which is in 1892. So, so here's a really interesting thing about the philosophy of language um, that I think one has to come to grips with in order to understand its role in Frege's development. Is that the, the really, really astonishingly hard mathematical work that Frege was doing to try to prove every truth of arithmetic in the world's most rigorous system is, it's a bunch of work whose first volume was published in 1893. These philosophy of language essays were published in 1891 and 1892. So it's not as if these were compartmentalized parts of Frege's life. He was working very, very hard on his logistics project when he stopped to write essays about language. And so, so I think a really interesting question is, you know, what is the connection here? Um, and here I think is at least part of the connection. Um, one aspect of Frege's view of mathematics that we haven't talked about very much is that he thinks that um, arithmetical claims like two plus two equals four are true because these objects two and four have various properties and stand in various relations to one another. So he's not one of these people who says you need to explain away this apparent reference to numbers. He thinks, no, we really do refer to numbers. Um, when we say there are infinitely many prime numbers, we're making a claim that's just like saying there are lots of coffee cups. We're just saying some things exist and the claim is true because the things exist. Okay, so given that background, um, think about the following two sentences. Um, three squared equals nine and nine equals nine. Now, it, it looks like those sentences clearly say different things. And one way to become convinced of the fact that they say different things is that what would count as a proof of one does not count as a proof of the other. And Frege's view is that what you're proving is not the sentences, but what the sentences say. Uh -huh. So let me just um, explain that for just a moment. Frege thinks that when you give a proof, you can give the proof in German, you can give the proof in English, you can give the proof in a fancy formal language, and it can still be the same proof. So mathematicians who speak different languages are still doing the same mathematics. Okay, so now when we ask, so what is it that three squared equals nine? What is it that that sentence expresses? And we ask ourselves, does it express the same thing as nine equals nine? Uh -huh. When we notice that 
a proof of nine equals nine, which takes one line, <laughs> won't count as a proof of three squared equals nine. We have to recognize that what's expressed by those sentences must be different. And so, so far so good. But then if you say, but wait, it's supposed to be the case that mathematics is about these particular objects. So three squared, that, that piece of language, just refers to the object nine. Uh -huh. And, and the symbol nine just refers to the object nine. So it looks like the sentences cannot, in fact, express different claims. They both just say this object is this object. And so, so this, I think, is one way to think about the main motivation for Frege's probably, or probably the thing for which he is most famous, namely the distinction between sense and reference. So, so Frege's view, as it comes out in 1892, is that each sentence has two different kinds of meaning, or each, each piece of language has two different kinds of meaning. And let's start with those little pieces of language, the, the symbol nine oh. and the slightly more complicated symbol three squared. So he thinks that the symbol nine, it refers to, it has as its reference an object nine and three squared also has as its reference the object nine. So it's what we said before, those two little symbols refer to the same object, but they have different senses. They refer to the object in different ways. Frege's famous example of this is of course not an arithmetical example because he didn't expect his audience to agree with him mm -hmm. that numbers are objects. So his most famous example of this is um, the morning star and the evening star. Those two terms both referring to the same object, namely the planet Venus. And, and Frege illustrates the issue by pointing out that when you say the morning star is the morning star, you don't say anything very interesting. But when you say the morning star is the evening star, you say something that it would take astronomical research to, um, to demonstrate. Oh. And so in this case, again, we see that two pieces of language can refer to the same object, namely the planet Venus, but they can do so in different ways. The morning star, the phrase the morning star and the phrase the evening star then have the same reference, but a different sense. And so now when we look at a complete sentence, a sentence like three squared equals nine or nine equals nine, we can see that those two sentences, even though their parts have different references, the fact that their parts have different senses is important. So the sense expressed by three squared equals nine is different from the sense expressed by nine equals nine. Why? Because they have parts that have different senses. Similarly, the sense expressed by the morning star is the morning star is different from the sense expressed by the morning star is the evening star. So there's, um, there's his most famous innovation, as it were, the distinction between sense and reference. It's the idea that, um, that words don't just stand for things, they do other stuff too. Mm -hmm. they have sense. Um, this is, I think, really important, in fact, to, to his view about the nature of mathematics, but he doesn't talk very much about this connection. Um, it comes up here and there, but there's very little philosophy of language in his formal mathematical work, and there are lots of interesting things people have to say about why that is, and there's not very much mathematics in his philosophy of language, though there's the occasional mathematical example. And I think the main reason for this is just that he didn't want in introducing the philosophical issues to, to complicate his argument against various forms of idealism and Kantian views and, and things like that. Um, so, so there's the big thing. It's the distinction between sense and reference. Um, there are other aspects of Frege's philosophy of language that have been extremely influential as well. And they are also connected with his philosophy of mathematics and logic. One of them is what's called the context principle, which has arguably been influential in all of analytic philosophy. And it's just this, it's the statement that if you, if you wanna know the meaning of a word, don't, don't just look for a thing that that word stands for. As Frege says, don't look for the meaning of the word in isolation, but look at the contribution made by that word to the sentences in which it occurs. Uh -huh. and, one of the things that he says in the Foundations of Arithmetic is that if you forget this principle, then you're likely to make the mistake of thinking that arithmetic is about ideas. And so let me just say why you might, why he thinks this. 
at least in my view, why he thinks this. It's as follows. If you want to know what the number, let's, let's just take the numeral three. If you want to know what that numeral stands for, um, that is to say, if you violate the context principle and you ask, what, what thing does this numeral stand for? And you look around, <laughs> there are any things. It's hard to find anything. And so the, the only thing it could really stand for, if you're looking for a thing for it to stand for, is maybe an idea in your head. So then you get the, the picture that, okay, number words stand for ideas, and then arithmetic is all about our ideas, and then you're off to the races on a very bad theory, says Frege. Uh -huh. um, he thinks instead, if you want to know what the numeral three means, you should look at how it works in sentences, and you should look at how it is, well, what are the truth conditions of a sentence like, there are three pens on my desk. There's a, a use of the word three, and if you can understand how it works in that context, and you can also understand how it works in contexts like three is the successor of two. If you can meld those together into a good account of the meanings of entire sentences, you will then know what the numeral three means. Okay, so, so the context principle, again, is the idea that in order to understand the meaning of a word, you should look at the contribution that that word makes to the sentences in which it occurs, rather than looking for an object that you would, you would have to find by taking the word in isolation. There's a lot of um, debate about whether Frege maintains the context principle throughout his, uh, throughout his life. Um, and my view on that is that he does, yeah. um, and that it's a very important principle, but there are reasons, there are reasons to doubt this. So, so yeah. there's a certain amount of back and forth. It's a, you know, if, if one gets really into the weeds of um, Frege's philosophy of language and scholarship on it, one has to have a view about this. But um, one thing that seems clear is that the context principle itself has had a lasting influence. I think it was very influential on Wittgenstein. It seems to have been very influential on Carnap. Oh. Um, and so, so there's another piece of Frege's philosophy of language, which one needs to come to grips with in order to figure out what his kind of legacy was with respect to his views about language. I can't help but be reminded of Wittgenstein's uh, coat only in the nexus of a, propos uh, of a proposition has a name, has name has a meaning, something yeah, to that effect. Yeah, yeah. And I, I think that that's as clear as um, <laughs> um, nothing fancy, that's Frege. Mm. Yeah. Okay, so for you, what's the lasting legacy of Frege's philosophy? It's complicated. Um, so, we talked about part of it already, that is to say the foundation that he gave us for modern logic, um, both making it clear how important quantifiers are and how you can deal with them systematically was, was huge. Um, his, his view that in order to understand various kinds of knowledge, and in particular for him, most importantly, knowledge of mathematics, you really have to understand how the language of mathematics works that's an enormously important legacy. Not everybody agrees with Frege's particular views about language, but I think it's fair to say that it would be hard to reject Frege's thought that um, in order to understand what it is that we do when we come to know something, it's really important to understand what the words mean that we use to express that thing. So that the, the integration between questions about language and questions about knowledge, I think is a lasting legacy of Frege's work. He's not the first person who thought this. I think Plato thought this as well, but, but Frege used this idea in a, in a much more systematic way, I think, than had been used before and was extremely influential in this. Um, the idea that, that conceptual analysis can be done rigorously, can be defended, can be the source of insights, um, had a lasting influence in part because a lot of people want to reject it. So there's a sense in which, um, there's a sense in which the, the tradition that goes from Frege to Carnap to Quine involves changes and rejections of Frege's view about how fruitful conceptual analysis can be. So, so that's a way in which his legacy has been important. It, it has spawned arguments about about the role of conceptual analysis. And I think um, 
I think the arguments are extremely fruitful and are alive and well. Um, his views about mathematics and logic have been extraordinarily influential. So he, he, um, his rejection of psychologism was robust and scathing and made a lasting impression on, on mathematics and philosophy of mathematics. Um, his views about axioms, which we haven't talked very much about, were also very important and influential. So there was a, a famous a debate is not quite the right word, but, but uh, something like a debate between Frege and Hilbert about the nature of axioms and the nature of theories and um, that focused on the nature of consistency and independence proofs. And there's a sense in which Frege was representing an older view and Hilbert was representing a newer and now dominant view. So it's, it's easy to see Frege as, as having views here which have simply been eclipsed, but, but I think that that's not quite right. I think that Frege, um, that the Frege-Hilbert debate gave us um, an opportunity to, well, I think they themselves articulated um, some really important points at which one needs to take a stand on what a theory is and what an axiom is and what it is that we're looking for when we're looking for a consistency proof. Um, a bunch of questions that come up here turn on whether or not the kind of consistency that we now look for in the mathematical theory, namely the kind of consistency that's demonstrated by giving a model, whether that kind of consistency um, is something like consistency in a pre-theoretic sense. And also questions like um, whether or not the kind of entailment relation that we talk about now that we demonstrate by giving models, whether that is the same thing as a kind of pre-theoretic entailment relation. Frege's, Frege's um, articulation of very clear systems of logic and views about them made it possible for us to raise questions like that um, and he has a very clear view, I think, which is that the answer is roughly speaking, no. In fact, there's a big gulf between the, the mm. old fashioned intuitive compelling questions about mm. consequence and consistency and independence and the, the new notions. So in any case, I think finally a large, um, well, an important part of Frege's legacy is that he has um, made it possible to ask and to answer with some technical detail, fundamental questions about the nature of logical relations. Okay, so on a more personal note, you've been one of the best philosophers that we have, living philosophers and historian of philosophy, but what's your advice for those who want to get into professional academic philosophy? Um, my main advice is vote for people who value state-supported education because, yeah. because higher education, education in general is in a very bad way at the moment. I was very fortunate to have been educated in a time when public universities in the United States were free um, or darn close to free and very, very, very good. And this was also a time when um, there were a reasonable number of jobs and these are connected points. <laughs> this was the era in, in which um, it was thought of as an important part of, of society uh, to have good universities and that it was something that we um, as a community should support. And this has fallen by the wayside in many, many countries at the moment and has made it both much more difficult for people to get a university education and unfortunately, much more difficult for people to get a university job. So there aren't nearly as many good jobs as there were. So anyway, that's my, my first point is um, advocate for a much um, more robust kind of support for the academy. But, but more specifically, yeah, how to think about an academic job. Um, <laughs> you know, the, the only thing to be said is people stumble into academic jobs. They, they, find a, um, they find an area of inquiry that they fall in love with and they end up going to graduate school, not typically because they think, I've always wanted to be a university professor or a professor of any kind, 
but because they just don't want to stop thinking about their topic and and hopefully because they've also discovered that they have a certain expertise at teaching and they enjoy teaching that at least is my story i love teaching um so i think really the thing to be said about an academic career how to, how to uh, prepare for it is you've got to follow what you love and also be aware that it, it might turn out that you have to leave it too um so keeping your options open especially if you are you know trying to support any other people besides yourself um, <laughs> is important. It's really hard to become an academic these days. No, is a career in philosophy worth it? Or would you say that your career is worth it? My career is worth it, no question, yes. But I'm extremely fortunate. Um, yes, I love my job. I have an extremely re rewarding job. I have, um, uh, yeah, I do what I love. Um, I adore teaching. And as, as painful as writing philosophy is, I do like figuring out the things that I finally write as papers. Um, and so, yeah, it's, um, it's a real gift to have an intellectually fulfilling career. So yeah, I mean, if your question is, is it worth it for me? Absolutely. Um, I, I've enjoyed almost every step of the way. Um, if you mean, is it worth it now? I mean, I'm, I'm old enough that the job market was quite different when I looked for a job. <laughs> and that's, that really is going to depend on the person. Um, I think there are easier ways to make a living. That is to say there are ways that, that get you into uh, making enough money to live on a lot earlier. Mm -hmm. And in a more guaranteed sort of way, it's a real hit and miss kind of thing. I, I, I am under no illusions that it was, um, merely uh, my skills that got me a successful career. It was an enormous amount of mere good fortune and help and luck. So yeah, it's, uh, it's a great uh, career to have, but it's not always a great um, path to get to it. Okay. So thanks again, Professor Blanchard for sharing your time with us and for you guys. Please like and subscribe to my YouTube channel. Join me again for another episode of Philosophy and What Matters, where we discuss things that matter from a philosophical point of view. Cheers. Thank you.